1 Peter 4, 12 through 13. Peter admonishes, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But he said, rather rejoice, not the natural uh, response, but he said, rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may, that's you and me, that we may be glad also with exceeding joy, with exceeding joy. And I would like, as I feel God has impressed me and laid on my heart this week with his help, I would like to minister this morning from this subject, adversity's advantage. Adversity's advantage. And you may be seated as we pray one more time for the Lord to minister to us. Father, we thank you for your word that is forever settled and eternal. Your words that are spirit and life. And God, I pray today that you would help your servant. Let there be an unction in my mouth. And may the hand of God rest upon me, Lord, as I do your will as my prayer. And that you would lead and guide. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church today. And may we all leave encouraged in Christ our Lord. And everyone said amen. Amen. Adversity's advantage. Adversity, by definition, is adverse or unfavorable fortune or fate. When we talk about adverse, it means something that is antagonistic in purpose or effect. It is opposing, if you will, to one inch, one's interest or desire. Adversity is a condition that is marked by misfortune, calamity, and or distress. It can also be an unfortunate event or circumstance that happens to unfold in our lives along this journey we call life. I would ask the question, and you are free to respond with either a showing of the hand or a raising of the hand, but I would ask the question to us, is there anyone here this morning that is facing and or dealing with some type of adversity in your life? Some type of adversity in your life. Amen. Amen. Adversity, as we come to understand more deeply this morning, adversity is one of the most potent forces in life. It shapes your character. It clarifies your priorities. It can define your path. And it can also fuel, if managed and if perceived properly, it can fuel our greatness. Every one of us here today we face a rich assortment of adversities every single day, ranging from either minor hassles to major setbacks and challenges, and even at times the unfortunate tragedies that may happen to befall us in life. It was Jesus, our Savior, that said, it is impossible, but that offenses will come. He said it's an impossibility to go through life without encountering or being tempted to be offended. But the same is true with adversity. It is very much a part of life. We look to Job in the fifth chapter in the sixth verse. Job, and I'll focus a little on Job this morning and a few other icons, if you will, in Scripture. But Job said it like this. Although affliction does not come forth of the dust and neither does trouble spring out of the ground. In other words, uh, this is not a matter of creation itself. He said, yet man is born unto trouble and as the sparks fly upward. In other words, when we come into this life, we are bound to come in contact with affliction and or adversity. 
He would go on later to say that man that is born of woman is of few days and full of trouble. Not very encouraging, Job, but we're going to come to see it is the lens that he is looking at at a particular or looking through at a particular point in time in his life. Now the Apostle Paul would also echo this expectation concerning our spiritual journey. It's not just life, it's not just whatever happens to befall us, but on our spiritual journey toward eternal life, the Apostle Paul admonished that it is through much tribulation, much adversity, that you and I shall enter into the kingdom of God. Adversity. Adversity can most certainly seem or be a disadvantage, but adversity also has advantages. We look to the book of Ecclesiastes as we dive deeper into the origin of this thing called adversity. And we read as Solomon penned the words that in the day of prosperity, he said, be joyful. Remember to be aware and embrace those good days, the good times, because he says, but in the day of adversity, consider. Think about it. Think about it. He said that God also hath set the one over against the other. In other words, what he is saying, as the NLT would put it, he is saying, realize that both come from God. The day of prosperity and the day of adversity. He said they both come from God. And remember that nothing is certain in this life. And so what we realize, I trust as those that have lived a little bit, we are reminded yet again that adversity does not discriminate. Adversity comes to all at some time or another. And this is important for us here today. Whether in the will of God or out of the will of God, adversity at some point will find us. All we have to do is look to Jonah the prophet in terms of being out of the will of God. Jonah was met head on with adversity. And yes, this adversity came from God as a course correcting element, if you will, to get Jonah in the purpose and the will of God. The adversity that he faced was that God sent out a great wind and stirred up a mighty tempest in the sea. The adversity was with his fellow journeyman. The adversity was that great fish that would ultimately swallow Jonah up and then spit him out. He was out of the will of God and the Lord took that adversity to put him back on course. Now conversely, we look at the Apostle Paul, and if you ever read closely and carefully about the encounters of the Apostle Paul, it, it could seem and be a little bit depressing unless we have this higher perspective that both come from God. Because the Apostle Paul, without question, faced more than his fair share of adversity while being in the will of God. Never do we read that the Apostle Paul was ever out of the will of God and yet he bore the blows of 195 stripes to his back. Three times he was beaten. He was stoned. He spent three days and nights shipwrecked in the deep. He spent 24 hours another time. The Apostle Paul faced much adversity. He faced the perils of waters and the peril of people, both robbers and his fellow countrymen and heathens and false brethren. Paul would face adversity in the places that he would go, in cities, in the wilderness, and on the sea. He would face peril and adversity in terms of condition and circumstances. He said, I was weary, I was in pain, I was hungry and thirsty, cold and naked. All of this adversity that he would encounter along the journey of doing God's will and delivering the gospel to his known world. He said, all of this were all external elements with people, places, and conditions. But he said on top of all of that, the internal adversity that I have had to face on a daily basis, the stress and the pressures of caring for all of the churches, those adversities of mind and thought that would weigh on him. 
And this morning, whether in or out of the will of God, we understand again that whether they be headaches or hardships, whether they be troubles or sufferings or difficulties, be they big or small, no matter what, adversity can be a daunting and overwhelming force. I wonder if I have any witnesses here this morning. Amen. And yet every one of us, can bank on the fact that in some degree or another, we are going to face adversity. And it's Peter that reminds us something that we most certainly need to be reminded of, especially in the days in which we find ourselves living, especially with the uncertainty that we are heading into as we are in, no doubt, the last days. And we don't know what is on the horizon, but we all must be reminded to not Think it strange concerning the adversity, the fiery trials which have come to try us. Because adversity, we need this reminder, because when adversity, when it strikes, it does in fact set us back on our heels. And if we're honest with each other, it does often come as a surprise. And so if we're not careful, whatever its form or degree of force, that adversity can come crashing down on us like an emotional avalanche. And it has the power to paralyze us and the power to put us in a position where it buries us beneath the avalanche of despair and doubt, hopelessness, self-pity and anguish, and even bitterness of soul. Has anybody beside me ever been there before? I've been there before many times, unfortunately. It can bury us, and at the same time, if we're not careful, if we allow it to, it will blind you and me to the reality, depending on our response, and we'll talk about that before we leave today, but depending on our response, the adversity, it will blind us to the reality that adversity can work to our advantage. And it does have the power, if you and I will manage it and negotiate it appropriately to shape and shift our future. It doesn't mean it has to be permanent. Again, this morning, we look no further than Job. I was, I was reading Job over the last couple of weeks, and I'm, I'm looking into the life of Job, and it's, it's so deep. It's so, it's so complex. There are so many facets to this book called Job. Job goes from being the greatest of all the men of the East to loathing his own life literally overnight. He goes to bed one night. He's a prince among men. He wakes up the next day. His world has been destroyed and Job is loathing his own life. He goes from being the most celebrated of all men to cursing the day of his birth in one, one, one day. He's wishing that he had died in the womb like a stillborn and being carried straight to the grave after having been delivered. This is now what Job is wishing for. He begins to feel the crushing weight of the avalanche of adversity that is unfolding in his life. One day he's living his best life. The next day he is longing for death. Literally, read the book. It is unbelievable. He begins bellowing out accusations and questions like often we do when adversity first strikes. We immediately go to accusing. We immediately go to questioning. What's happening? I, am I out of the will of God? And am I in the will of God? God, where are you? Why is this happening in my life? This is what Job said in verses six, chapter 16 and 12. Listen to this. He said, I was at ease, but he, meaning God, hath broken me asunder. He hath also taken me, Job said, by the neck, and he shook me to pieces and set me up as his mark. In other words, he's saying that I am the target of God's arrows. I am literally drinking in the poison and the pain of God causing me to be his enemy. And then he would say something like this, because he is polarized, as we often find ourselves, he is polarized by what he is feeling. Feeling in his natural man and the facts that he knows to be true in his spirit man. He is in this polarized position. 
So he's saying, look, I have become the enemy of God. He has hedged me in, not in the way we talked about a few weeks ago in terms of insulating. Now Job sees it as isolating him, walling him in, blocking his path, shrouding him in darkness. And yet at the same time, listen to the words of the same man in the same situation. This is what he said, though he set me up for his mark in Job 13 and 15. He said, yea, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. So he's caught between God is out to destroy me, but I trust God even though he slay me. He feels forsaken but he, because he can't find him. He said, I'm looking everywhere. I go to the left. I go to the right. I go ahead of me. I turn back. I can't find God anywhere. God, where are you? And yet he knows the fact of this, that though I can't find him, yet he knows the way that I take. And when I come through this trial, when this adversity passes, I'm coming out tried as gold. He, he knows this. He, he knows, he knows that his suffering is without, he does not know, excuse me, but I want us to know that his suffering is without cause. See, we got to go back to the beginning and read very carefully. God says to Satan, go ahead, you're going to make me to destroy him without cause. So even God is confessing, hey, he's done nothing wrong, and yet adversity has come to him in this, uh, this, this catastrophic proportion, and he's experiencing Job on sparing pain and grief and calamity of catastrophic degree, and yet this was his conclusion. And again, I'm pointing this out because this is often where we find ourselves with the improper response when adversity does in fact strike. Job literally sums up his situation after having just been celebrated as the greatest of all men in the East. And this is what he does. He wakes up now and he said, my eye shall no more see good. Job said, I've lived the last of the good days that I'll ever experience in this life. He literally says, you have stripped me of my honor. You've taken the crown off of my head. You have, you have rooted up hope in my life. There's no more hope. I've seen my best days and they're behind me. And what Job does not realize, even though he's saying that he will never ever see good again, Job doesn't realize that he is literally just days away from being doubly blessed. Last. I would to God this morning as he has sent me with this word today, I would to God that you would look at the adversity that is before you, that you would put aside the accusation, put down the question mark, and you would realize you may not have done anything wrong whatsoever, but the good and the days of prosperity and the days of adversity, they are both from God, and your best days are not behind you. Could it be that God is setting you up for the advantage of your best days yet ever? Job does not even understand. And he's caught in this, this, this trap. This, this, he's being pulled apart. He said this. He said literally after the worms destroy my body. After my worms destroy me. Then he turns around in the same breath and says yet in the flesh I will see God. Can you feel it? He knows what's going on in terms of God and his character and truth, yet he's caught up with his feelings in the moment, and he sees not another good day ahead. And the Bible tells us that when God got finished, when that adversity passed, that Job was given twice as much as he had before. Twice as much. Psychologists... They first described the term in 1967. It's called learned helplessness. It's a learned helplessness. Somebody hear me this morning. Learned helplessness is a state that occurs after a person has experienced a stressful situation repeatedly over and over again. 
from childhood forward. And they begin to believe, listen to the lie, they begin to believe that they are unable to control or change the situation. And because they look through this lens of impossibility, they literally fail to even try to do something with what they're now faced with in their situation, even when the opportunity for change exists. It is a learned helplessness. And I fear, and I, I bring this out because every one of us is prone and somewhat programmed from birth to understand that when calamity comes, when the fiery trial presents itself, we immediately go into the default of learned helplessness. We immediately position ourselves underneath the avalanche of all that is coming down or coming at us. And what it does is it increases feelings of stress and depression. When we are in this state of learned helplessness, we lose motivation. And we're unable to make decisions and become passive in the moment or in the present. While yet in fact, change is absolutely possible. It's a learned helplessness. And what we've got to understand today is that every opportunity, everything we see as an opportunity in life is counterbalanced by a difficulty. It is just the way of God. Whether it is logistical, relational, circumstantial, financial, whatever it is, every opportunity is going to present its fair quotient of difficulty. Now, now we've heard, we've heard of IQ and perhaps many of us have heard of EQ. This is what those that are experts in the field say. That when you look at success, it is made up of 20% IQ, intelligence, the intelligence quotient. And then they say the other 80% is EQ, our emotional quotient. The ability to handle things emotionally. And those that are in that balance or that ratio, they deem to be the most successful. But they have discovered over the last several years, they have discovered that there's something even beyond IQ and EQ. And that is called AQ. And AQ is the adversity quotient. And they say that AQ is even more important than IQ and EQ. Now, now this, uh, this is challenging to me. This is, this is so powerful when it comes uh, to our walk and the, and the adversity that our God allows in our lives for a greater purpose than what we often perceive. The adversity, adversity quotient is referring, listen to this, to an individual's resilience and capacity to handle setbacks, challenges, and adversity effectively. How effectively are we able to handle the adversity? Watch, it measures a person's ability to persevere, to continue on, to bounce back from difficult situations, demonstrating adaptability, tenacity, and yes, emotional intelligence. And this is what they say. They say that if IQ and EQ determine how well a person can go, then it's AQ that determines how far a person can go. And every one of us is wired from birth with this with a certain quotient of AQ. And we believe the lie that somehow it is fixed and it cannot be changed. But I'm telling you before we leave today, especially those of us in Christ, that quotient can be altered. It can be improved and it can be changed. So it's not just IQ and it's not just EQ. It is our AQ. The ability to bounce back and persevere in spite of the setbacks and the adversity that we experience. So what first appears 
to be an obstacle can if we, you and me, if we properly negotiate the situation, it can become an opportunity and or an advantage. Job doesn't even realize in the moment he believes he's being destroyed by God. He doesn't even realize that God has set him center stage and is using the adversity to his advantage to bring him to a place of higher honor and a place of greater prominence than he's ever experienced and I will insert he could not have gotten there otherwise. I I want you to think with me this morning about almost uh, every major success story. I want you to think about the success stories that stand out most in your mind. I want you to think about the brilliant innovation, the world, the altering achievements that we've seen and know that individuals on our planet have have accomplished. And when you look deeper beneath the surface, we find individuals who faced incredible adversity and individuals that had to overcome insurmountable odds, mostly because this. Because they converted their misfortune, their hardship, their harsh conditions, they converted it into the very fuel that would then propel them to that place of advantage, that place of greatness that they would listen, they would have never arrived at in the absence of adversity. And I want you to think about that. Because because the truth is often we immediately default to being helpless. Or we immediately find ourselves buried underneath the avalanche of all that emotion, of all the accusation, of all the questioning, rather than seeing that God is setting us up for advantage. Can can I can I can I again I who was it, Brother Myron Weidman? You gotta read the word very, very slowly. And when you read the word of God very, very slowly, you know what you find? It it, it is amazing to me. You know what you find? Job said, I'm looking for him. I can't find him, but he knows the way that I take. Through that entire process, Job doesn't realize that if God ever did withdraw his hand, Job would have been done at the first strike of adversity. That first day, he'd have been dead. You, 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 you turn around and you look. You look at David. You look at David. Do you think David would have ever survived Saul and all that he went through in the wilderness had God withdrew from David? No, no, no. It was David who had that understanding that God was his fortress, his shield, his buckler, his rock, his strong tower. He was his help. He, it, it, David understood. God never left David. When you look at Joseph, the Bible says that God was with Joseph. The grace of God was assisting Joseph through every trial and every tragedy and all the misfortune and misery. God was with him every single step of the way. He never departed for so left every and any one that accomplished greatness in the scripture. So I would ask you and me today, why is it that we so quickly, why is it that we so quickly feel forsaken and left and we feel as though God is taking us by the nap of the neck and shaking us to pieces? Can I tell you the grace of God is with you? Can I tell you all things are working together for your good I know you may can't see it like Job couldn't see it but I'm telling you right now for the grace and the mercy of God he has not left you he has not forsaken you he is with you he is with you do not determine his presence by your condition in the present do not determine God's presence in your present hardship